Okay, folks, um, we're going to get started here with the uh, last uh, session of this morning. And uh, we have Josh Goldenhar um, from <laughs> Accelero. Yep, thanks. Well, I see what happens when you're the last one between uh, presentations and lunch. So, but thanks for being here. I'm Josh Goldenhar, the VP of Products for Accelero. Uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about our software deployed or software defined storage product uh, that we tested in Facebook Labs successfully. And actually, we just launched the company officially yesterday. So if you go to uh, www.accelero.com, uh, you can not only see you know, different things about our company, but there's also a blog posting there uh, about the testing we did in the, uh, the OCP Labs. So let's go ahead to the next slide, please. Uh, a little bit about us, briefly. Uh, like all good storage companies, we were founded in Israel, um, but uh, operate here out of the United States. Sales and marketing is here. That's where I'm based. And uh, we had two rounds of funding. Um, second round was by a leading uh, VC, Battery Ventures, and also if you guys know who David Flynn is, uh, the interesting thing there is David was hired to do the due diligence on us and was so impressed, he decided to put his own money into the company. So we're happy to have him as a board advisor and as someone who definitely knows the flash space uh, helping us out there. Uh, we do have one patent that just got granted very much, and we'll tell you just a little bit about that. Uh, it helps uh, some do some, some of the amazing stuff our, our software can do. Is, helps us in there. Uh, web scale cloud and service providers is our main target. So hopefully if you're in this room uh, and you're thinking about OCP, that's probably the right uh, marketplace. Uh, we have several customers already, some we can't talk about. Uh, there's more than this, but NASA Ames uh, here in, in the Bay Area, Moffett Field was our first one with an HPC slant. But uh, PayPal and GE Digital with the Predix Cloud are also, we're happy to say, our, our paying customers. So uh, we've got some interesting folks there, as well as some other uh, properties that are in the web scale class uh, that we can't really discuss, but there are more. And of course, we have a, a range of partnerships here across the bottom. Next, please. And so what did we do? As a company starting out a couple years ago, uh, we talked heavily with Facebook. Uh, we talked with Google. We've talked with Microsoft Azure. Uh, we've talked to Amazon. Why did we talk to these folks? We didn't think they were going to buy from us. Um, we talked to them to get the, the experience they have, what they expect out of their applications, and kind of the things that they've done internally, too. Because what if you're not a company that can afford 300 or 3,000 or, or 30,000 employees? You know, do you have a budget that in your space, especially if you're a smaller web startup? Um, can you hire engineers just to develop back-end infrastructure? You want to put the reference, you want to put the resources you have into your application, not building infrastructure. These guys are masters at doing these scale-out, hyper-efficient hardware data centers. But to do that, to take advantage of hyper-efficiency in hardware, you also have to really be able to tailor your software. You have to be able to exactly tailor your software to take advantage of the fact that you have homogeneity in your servers. If you really deploy OCP, um, and it's every single server is a standalone server, they're ubiquitous, but you have to be able to divide up your data set. You have to be doing everything in a very scale-out manner. And so you have to plan for that, and it can be kind of difficult. So what we did was take all this information, take it in, and basically make a software-defined storage product that lets you get these hyper-efficiencies out of these hardware platforms and allows you to share NVMe. We're designed for NVMe. Uh, we sh can share NVMe flash across multiple systems, and it behaves as if it's still local NVMe. So to what you heard earlier about the AVA card, we actually did testing in the OCP labs on the AVA card that holds four M.2 sticks. We could equally work with the Lightning platform, the very dense PCIe connected to hosts, uh, and with a, with a fast Ethernet, that is the 25, 50 gigabit uh, Mellanox would be preferred, which is what we tested you can get low latency access to shared flash, and basically all data becomes local. You're no longer bounded to access only what you can fit inside one server sled. You can access any of the NVMe flash anywhere in the rack, anywhere in an adjacent rack if you want, as if it's local. And on top of that, you can add redundancy. You can have dynamic logical volumes. 
so you're not just sharing, but you can also have levels of redundancy that you couldn't have with just local flash. Next slide, please. Um, so I think I just talked about this. Uh, OCP's mission is quoted here. We want to do that for software as well. Basically ask you, if you have a hyper-optimized hardware platform and you've done everything to eke out every dollar of cost out of your hardware platform and you start incorporating Flash inside your servers, what happens, as, as we've heard from interviews with companies like LinkedIn, uh, if you go ahead and, and look at our website, we did Tech Field Day yesterday. We had a guest speaker from LinkedIn who talked about his experiences not just with our software, but in their software deployment environment, and how even at LinkedIn, at scale, they were only getting 25% capacity utilization out of the SSDs that they put locally in the systems. That's because when you build an entire rack and you want to save costs there, you put the same exact SSD in every server. Some servers may only use a tenth of that, and some may be at 90%. Their overall capacity utilization was only 25%. So you take our software layer, and now you don't have to over-provision. You can share all of that NVMe as one pool. By the way, we actually do work with SATA as well, but they're really distinct advantages for using NVMe. Um, you can share all that NVMe, and it behaves as if it's local, sharing amongst all sorts of different machines. So we, we basically let you take the most optimized hardware platform, but then get the most out of it, not lose money in operations or in having to over-provision your flash. Next one, please. So what we are, we are a 100% software product. Software-defined SAN, uh, a, a virtual array, if you will. Uh, you take your, we work on, on Linux, Linux only. Uh, we can work with KVM hypervisor. If you combine that with SRIOV, you can actually get higher levels of performance, or lower latency to flash devices over a network than you can going through the hypervisor to local flash. So if you are in that kind of instance, uh, you can use uh, the KVM hypervisor. We've also worked with Zen server. Um, bare metal, though, is, is pretty much king. And we have uh, optimizations to integrate into different provisioning environments if you are provisioning bare metal. So we're virtual SAN for NVMe. I think I mentioned that. And we have the highest distributed NVMe performance. If you look at our demo that we gave yesterday, which has been recorded as part of Tech Field Day, you'll see us demonstrating live that we're only a mere five microseconds of overhead. So whatever you can get with local NVMe, you can access that remotely through logical volumes with our software with only five additional microseconds, which means you can get up to millions of random read or random write IOPS at sub 100 microsecond reads at sub 30 microsecond writes. So if you need very, very high transactional rates in something you're doing, you can get this without being bound to a single server. Your applications can move around. We also support converged and disaggregated architectures. So if you want to use that AVA card and put one inside every single server and do completely converged architecture, you can do that. Very key about our software is, though, we do not use any CPU on the target. This sounds impossible, but again, you can see it in the demo we did yesterday. Uh, our technology, that one patent I mentioned at the beginning, RDDA, it stands for Remote Direct Device Access. It's a play on RDMA, only instead of accessing memory directly, remotely, we're accessing NVMe drives. So all the intelligence in our system is in the client. The client looks like a standard block device. The client knows how to talk to a remote host, that remote host's RDMA NIC, and it bypasses the CPU. The NIC itself does operations directly to the NVMe device. And then the NVMe device can return that operation to the NIC, which then goes back over the wire. We literally can serve millions of random read or random write IOPS from a host, and the host can be idling. The CPU load will be zero. What does this mean for you in a converged architecture in OCP? It means you can share storage, but all of the CPU is dedicated to your applications. No more noisy neighbor problem. If someone else is using your drives, it doesn't impact your application performance because you get all the CPU you plan for. If you're running containers, you, can, you might plan to say, my container needs a core. My container needs four cores. You can do this. You can split up your hosts and get all the CPU you paid for, even though you're sharing storage. So it's a key part of our technology, which enables what we call true convergence. Now, you don't like any of that. You want to use a lightning chassis, get as much dense flash in one chassis as you can, and hook it up via PCIe. This way, you, you, you get around the limitation of sharing via PCIe. 
Lightning is great, but you can only hook, hook it up to a limited number of hosts. We let you hook it up to those hosts. Those hosts, in turn, can share that ultra-fast NVMe flash storage to anything on the Ethernet network. You can also alternately use InfiniBand. So we support both Ethernet with Rocky protocol or InfiniBand. Next slide, please. Uh, this is going to be pretty pedestrian, I think, for probably most of the folks here. Um, Use standard hardware, OCP hardware, whatever hardware you want, and NVMe drives. We don't care if they're U.2, M.2, add-in cards. NVMe is it, which means we're also ready for Optane. Now, when Optane or 3D Crosspoint comes out in the NVMe form factor, you can do reads and writes in, depending on if the drives uh, perform like they're advertised, somewhere between 20 and 30 microseconds. Uh, so you can use this as extended memory. You can do memory mapping. Anything you can do with a block device, you can do with our software, only you can add redundancy and dynamic logical volumes. So we're a software layer. We are a kernel module on, this, on the target. We're a kernel module on the client. The client looks like a block device. The target module just runs wherever there's NVMe. And if you're running in the converged mode, both of these run on the same host. There is an independent management layer that's built on MongoDB and, uh, and JSON. So it's, it's just uh, it's a RESTful interface. It's highly programmatic, and we have documentation built into the product itself so that you can see the RESTful commands. Um, you have logical volumes. They're resizable. And then you put on whatever file system you want. Uh, I think I heard mention someone was asking earlier about burst buffer. Our solution with a file system, an intelligent one like GPFS, which has uh, which now been rebranded to Spectrum Scale, very, very uh, high performance solution where you can use that for a burst buffer if you want and have the file system automatically move that data uh, into another location. The benefit with us is that uh, GridScaler, or GP, excuse me, uh, GPFS, it's, uh, old, old habits die hard. Um, GPFS, spectrum scale, uh, has the ability, because it uses a shared SAN technology, to see drives on every single host. And if it sees that drive, it will go ahead and do IO to that drive locally. Now, this is built on traditional old-style SANs, where you had every host connected with fiber channel. And you did multi-attach, and every single host would see that, that actual logical drive. It would operate to it. We can do that same thing, but just on, without a, a separate network. It just happens on your Ethernet network, which means every single host thinks it has a local drive. All I.O. is local. This is what enables you, with our solution, to forget about data locality. All data is local. You no longer have to move data. You can move compute to the data rather than having to copy data around. Let's go on to the next one. Uh, I touched on this a little bit, but so we're a management layer that can be made redundant. However, it's not in the data path. If management goes down, the cluster keeps operating. The management layer is really just a configuration database. Uh, if it goes down, it's not accessible. What you lose out on is the ability to create new volumes or to attach volumes to hosts that haven't had them attached before. So you can't do new operations, but the cluster keeps working. Management is not in the data path. I touched on storage services. The storage services for us today are logical volumes, multipathing, the ability to do concatenated volumes, RAID 0 stripes, RAID 1 mirroring, and RAID 10. Uh, you can also dynamically grow the volumes. This all happens in the client. The client is intelligent. It talks directly to the other hosts that have the drives, and then down to the segments of the drives that you res reserve for those logical volumes all without any centralized metadata. There's no central metadata manager. There is no centralized bottleneck. A lot of this stuff sounds impossible, but we scale linearly out effectively forever to any kind of practical limit. Uh, when you go between switches, you're going to add another microsecond of latency for every switch hop. But when, uh, when we scale, you guys have all seen a graph for clustered whatever. And the graph goes like this, right? You start down at this point with zero hosts, and then uh, on the, uh, the y-axis, you have performance. And performance starts to go like this. And then you hit a certain number of nodes, and it tops out. And then you go more nodes, and it actually starts to go down because the internode communication starts to take over. We don't have that problem. We scale up, up and to the right, essentially as big as you want to go, because every time you add another target, every time you add another client, you're increasing the processing abilities, and you're increasing the bandwidth and aggregate IOPS you have in addition to your networking. So if you stripe the volumes across, you just keep scaling up and to the right. 
And that's where we do our storage services. Lastly, the, the abstraction layer, I said we have a target. And that seems uh, to be juxtaposed with what I said we don't, we don't use CPU. The target that runs in any host where there are NVMe drives, that target is actually kind of doing an inventory of drives, an inventory of NICs, reporting up to management. And it does validation and setup of the connections. But once the connections are done, it steps out of the way. It's not in the data path. And then the client goes directly from the remote client itself to the NVMe drives. The, the target that did a lot of this abstraction layer does get involved and does use CPU for quorum uh, to avoid split brain and to do recovery. So we don't want individual clients deciding, I think something's down. I'm going to go rebuild your mirror and use this other drive. We don't like that. The, the targets, they make those decisions. And that is, frankly, if you were doing a, a RAID 1 or a RAID 10 stripe and a disk failed, the target is going to go ahead and do the rebuild. Now, we can accelerate that by also using clients to do the rebuild. But on the targets, that will use some CPU in a recovery situation. Uh, any questions here on the different layers? No? OK. All right, let's go on. Um, now, I talked about this. Millions of IOPS. If you look at a demo we had yesterday, we demonstrated. It was not an OCP platform that was demonstrated on, but you could get to this as well. On a 2U24 server, we demonstrated 4.5 million random read IOPS uh, from a system that had 24 NVMe drives with zero CPU utilization. So no, the, the NICs were nearly saturated. They were at uh, near 20 gigabytes per second of 4K random IO. If you max these out, we had 200 gigabit interfaces. You can max out the line rate. You can get about 24 gigabytes per second in one server. I don't want you to focus on these numbers, these, these amazingly high numbers. They're not really that important. The important thing is whatever NVMe media you use in your servers, AVA cards, uh, Lightning, whatever media you use, this is how you extract the full performance of that media. And you make it shareable. You make it usable. How many folks in here have an application that runs on a single server that can consume 2 million IOPS, 3 million IOPS? Anybody? So I didn't expect any hands. If, if you need a typical server maybe can consume, if it's being pressed, 100,000, 200,000 IOPS on a regular basis, great. So you can, you can do disaggregated storage. And you can put this, at, you can think of it as top of rack flash with the lightning platform. And you can go ahead and consume those with the entire rack. If you want to go completely homogenous and only use OCP compute sleds, you can do that too. Use the AVA cards and have all or part of your systems have flash. But all the systems can access the flash, whether they have any local or not. And they won't impact their CPUs. This also means that if you do go disaggregated, you don't have to pick a top of the line CPU. Some of you may be saying, well, I could get open source stuff today. I could do ICER, I could do iSCSI, I could get some other projects, and I could get these really high bandwidth rates, and I can get IOPS up pretty high as well. You need to use a, like an Intel 2699 processor for that. You have to use a top bin processor. Uh, I don't know about you, what your, you know, the companies you work for, how much you can get that. But those are $3,500 to $4,000 processors, street price, per socket. So you could have $8,000 of just CPUs to get the top end. We did our demo yesterday with an E5-2630. It's a $350 CPU. So $700 in CPUs versus $8,000. You do the math. Let's uh, go on to the next one. Uh, these are the components I mentioned earlier. There is an intelligent block driver installs as a kernel module. There's also a kernel module that installs on targets. Again, if you're running Converge, this is illustrated as separate things. But if you're running in one host, and, and by the way, you, you're welcome to take as many pictures as you want. These are, this is uh, openly available on our website. So um, please, if you want to take pictures of me, that's good to know. Uh, no, it's, but this is, uh, this is public information now as of yesterday. So I'm really happy to be able to say that. Um, depicted here is separate, but in a converged model, you'd run the two modules in one. The management up above uh, is, the, is really a centralized database. Uh, can be made redundant. Again, I, I said it's, it's, it can scale out as far as you want to. It's, it's based on MongoDB and uh, stateless web services. So you can actually scale this out to very uh, 
uh, very large sizes. We have a complete RESTful interface. Our GUI, I know it's a GUI, I'm sorry, I, didn't, I said a bad word. But if you, our GUI is built on top of our own RESTful interface. So anything you can do in the GUI and more, you can do with our RESTful interface. And the RESTful interface is where we've made plugins, such as for Docker, uh, Kubernetes, uh, because we just translate the APIs of those kind of orchestration systems and provisioning systems into our RESTful interface. You could program directly to the RESTful interface to scale this out yourself. We also, in this model, support rack awareness, things like this, and that we have uh, what we call disk classes and target classes. So you can put machines, for instance, you can create a, a target class called rack one and one called rack two. And via provisioning, you can say, make me a RAID volume. I don't care which halves of the mirror go where, except I want one half in rack two and I want one half of the mirror in rack one. That way, I can have a rack be a failure domain. An entire rack can fail and I can stay up. So we support this kind of mechanism. Whatever you can humanly think of to divide this up, we allow you to put disks into classes by their serial number, by their manufacturer, by their wear level type, by their performance type, by who bought them, if they're blue or red. It doesn't matter. You can put all these things in, and you can make these into rules that you can use in your provisioning model. It's uh, very powerful for uh, doing large-scale provisioning. Next slide, please. I harped on this, so I'm not going to cover it too much more. You can go disaggregated or you can go converged. Converged, obviously, I.O. goes machine to machine. You can get very, very high levels of IOPS and aggregated bandwidth in the converged model. Again, I'm not focusing on a particular number. The key thing is, is we let you extract all the performance, all the bandwidth that your NVMe drives or your network can support. We are not the bottleneck. So in the converged model, you're going to be bottlenecked not by our software, but by the number of PCIe lanes you can fit in your systems. So when you do a, like something like a 2U24, uh, if it was standard gear, you're going to be limited to about 200 gigabits per second, 200 gigabit interfaces, 2 by 16s. If you use something like the Lightning platform, you can actually then divide that very dense PCIe tray into multiple servers. But every one server is going to be bound by how much network bandwidth you can get out of that. Um, build it any way you want. Next slide, please. That's our, uh, our feature set for 1.0 is uh, a patented RDDA technology, although we are working with NVMe over fabrics already. So if you want to use NVMe over fabrics, if you can run a 4.8 kernel, we're ready to go. We've already tested this. It works. Uh, we can also use SATA drives. I mentioned that briefly earlier. If you have SATA drives, what's the difference? They are not addressable. They're not memory addressable. So on the target, we will use CPU to use those drives. But if you want to use SATA, you can do that as well. The volumes we support are there. This information is available online. Uh, I told you about host, rack, and row awareness that you can do via our rules, what we call volume provisioning groups. Web GUI, some CLI commands, a RESTful API. Um, and then the topologies, we scale essentially limitlessly up to practical limits, that is at uh, near 100% linear performance. It's actually about, uh, I think it's 99.64% efficiency in how we scale. Uh, the clients are intelligent, completely distributed. That's what allows us to scale out as large as we do. And the protocols are there. Uh, next slide, please. We're getting right near the end there. Automation, I, I touched on this briefly. But because of the RESTful interface, you can integrate directly into Puppet, Chef, you know, pick your provisioning scheme, containers, uh, Mesos, Kubernetes, very easy to do. Next one, please. Talked about this already. It's just been simply giving an example. Right in our GUI interface, you can actually see the complete RESTful interface. Uh, today, right this instant, it's a read-only interface, but the next release, we're going to make that a writable interface. So you can actually test out RESTful commands right in the management system itself. You'll be able to see them, and you'll be able to then to execute them. Uh, no manuals to flip through. It's all on the system. It's live. Every update, it's live. Next slide, please. Um, this is just another example of that. Very ultra easy install. We're, we're, a, we're a yum. We're, for for RPM-based distributions, we have a yum repository, so you can just install very easily. We also have folks running on Ubuntu, uh, so we can support that as well. There's even folks running on uh, SUSE. So pick your, pick your Linux, but we can uh, basically support anything that's a 2.6 kernel and up. Next one, please. 
I talked about containers, so uh, you're getting near your time, so I'll skip that one. Web and cloud, applications, there's some key things here, but it's up to you. High bandwidth, high IOPS, low latency, whatever transactional load you want to put on there, indexes, if you want to do memory mapped operations, you can do any of this with remote flash as if it's local. Next one, please. If you're an innovative enterprise, uh, you can do real-time analytics, you can do intrusion detection, you can run a traditional database. Basically, you get out of it uh, what you will. If you're running Splunk and log processing or operational analytics, you can do that as well. Next one, please. HPC should be self-evident. 24 gigabytes per second in a single server that has two interfaces. So you can build up clustered file systems, uh, basically scale as high as you want to. But the media allows you to do random I.O. against that almost as effectively. So you can, in a an ana typical analytics, stream in the data as fast as possible, and then start a random load to actually do your analytics. Next. And that is uh, basically what we have there. We've told you a lot about this. You only need DCBX style switching. Basically, any OCP switch, any switch based on Broadcom silicon is going to work just fine. If you have InfiniBand, we can also work with that, and uh, Mellanox Ethernet works just fine. Next, please. NASA, I mentioned this, it's on our site. If you're interested, see about what they're doing. Uh, in a nutshell, 128 separate systems, each with one NVMe drive. They made it look like one giant 256 terabyte NVMe drive. And they got uh, effectively 140 gigabytes per second out of that. They were not limited by their network, they were limited by the devices. So 140 gigabytes per second, and I think it was 30 million plus uh, random read IOPS. Next, please. Hulu. <coughs> Uh, is actually deploying this. Uh, they will not act publicly as a reference, but uh, they are in there. Uh, Hulu is deploying us right now as we speak. Um, they are using it in, a, in an interesting way. Uh, it's not about performance for Hulu. It's about ease of use. It's about redundancy. It's about commodity hardware. Next, please. And that's it. I ran a t touch over. I apologize. Any questions? Yes. We're, you're right. We're using memory bandwidth because the RDMA operations from the NIC are actually going into host memory, and then they're going down to the NVMe devices. As NVMe devices come out with the 1.3 spec, manufacturers, NVMe SSD manufacturers that choose to make their memory directly addressable on the drive will alleviate that problem as well. At that point. Ex yes, and, exactly. And the way you're bypassing the CPU, is that with your proprietary driver? That is with our proprietary driver. If you use NVMe over fabrics, you would not get the CPU offload. But if you okay. use our RDDA, you will get that. If you, uh, NVMe over fabric, we're very happy something's getting standardized. But if you put even if the kernel module or the SPDK NVMe over a fabric target and you hit that system with millions of IOPS, you will drive the CPUs all the way up. <laughs> yeah. You've basically made a storage server and that's where we go back to, you're going to need a powerful CPU. With us, you can use a low power CPU. Right, as long as you're, I mean, as, as, as long as we're using software sort of based methods to do the. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, yeah. I get it. Thank you. All right, terrific. Anything else? Yes. On the target? The storage server. Okay, um, we're not using the CPU, so it's it doesn't matter the number of drives or taxing the CPU. We do run out of PCIe bandwidth, so uh, many of the there's not an OCP platform like this, but in a standard 2U24, most of the folks that have developed these have done them very similarly. They take a by 16 off one CPU, they take a by 16 off the other socket, and they use those for networking. And then they do the same thing. They take 16 off one socket and 16 off the other, and they feed a switched PCIe internal network to drive the drives. So that's very balanced, 32 to, one, 32 to the drives and 32 out. You're already oversubscribed, though, in drives. In a converged model, so you have the same thing. If you use a 25 gigabit card, let's say you're going to go very economical, only two NVMe drives, depending on the drives, but only two is a very nice balance because the 25 gigabit is going to fit very pretty nice to a by eight 
slot. And then each NVMe drive, if you're using U.2 or add-in cards, is probably a by four. And if you're using good drives, they're going to get about three gigabytes per second. So that tends to be a good balance. You have to balance it out for what you want. If you add more drives past your bandwidth limit, you're going to get very consistent, great latency. You're going to increase capacity with uniform latency, but you're not going to get any more IOPS. Yeah. Okay, guys, so um, this is going to close the session for now. I think you can yeah, we're, stay look, around for uh, a while if folks have questions. I can stick around. We're also, um, uh, I'm Josh at Accelero.com. So if you remember Accelero, I'm Josh at Accelero.com. Uh, we also have info at Accelero.com, which will end up coming to me as well. So if you have questions, I'm happy to stick around uh, or uh, please check us out. And uh, thanks so much for listening. Okay, so.